Hello, 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 and good afternoon. I'm back. Finally. Uh, yeah, and I am back with more lore equals gameplay. Thank you for joining us, joining me. Thank you for watching, joining us. I, <laughs> I'm still in Pathfinder's mode from last night. Uh, but yeah, thank you for joining me. Thank you for watching. Today, I'm going to be doing back-to-back -back installments with Lore Equals Gameplay. Uh, installments, episodes 3 and 4, which will be going up on YouTube uh, later this week. Uh, but we're going to be doing, doing them live right here and, and recording them. Uh, the first installment is um, going to be going over the lore behind the leaked capital ships from the Squadron 42 leak that came out a couple weeks ago. Um, I've been debating and going back and forth uh, with talking about these and going over the, the the lore because I you know I I'm not for spoilers you know I don't want to spoil anything for anyone you know especially story elements because CIG has been so adamant about not um, spoiling the story and you know I, I you know you, you don't want to. You know, they're, they're working really hard on Squadron 42. You know, it's a, a passion project. And you don't want to take someone's work out of context. And that's why I haven't been sharing. You know, I, I haven't, you know, I've watched the full leak. You know, I don't mind looking at it. Um, you know, I, I thought it was great. I think that if CIG had put out what was leaked on their own terms, scrubbed it for spoilers, you know, a, a, a nice eight minute long uh, visual teaser, you know, like the, the ones that we got before, you know, I think it would shut a whole lot of people up because it's really impressive, you know, even though it's, you know, just what we saw is 720p with bad music behind it. You know, it, it was, you know, pretty incredible. It, the, imagine the visual teasers that we've gotten before and the trailers that we've gotten before, but like five times that, you know, um, with what they saw, what you show you, and it really goes really far in order to give you the sense of scale um, with Squadron 42 and why it's taking so long because they're putting an awful lot of work into it. But there is one thing that really stood out to me and there's a, a just a couple seconds, a couple second blip within the, uh, within the leak that shows two massive capital ships um, that we have not seen before at all. Zero, nothing. You know, I, I've, you know, if you're like me, maybe you've been following leak, you know, SC leaks or pipeline or whatever, you know, and, and you know, they they did a a, a in engine walkthrough of the the Bengal and the Idris and the Javelin, you know, from a you know from files leaked from I think it was 2017, but they did a walkthrough in in 2020 of it, which was pretty impressive, you know, considering that's you know, two years ago looking at assets that were you know, are now five years old. But uh, what we are going to look at today and read um, the lore behind today is stuff that CIG has never shown us. Um, but C even though CIG has never shown us, they have told us about it um, in the lore and then as well in the development of the game. Um, and I find it pretty impressive that through all this time, you know, and, and all the leaks and all the, the stuff that's slipped into the files, at, at no point have we ever seen these before. Um, and it, to me, it um, it's heartening because you, you can look at it, you know, one of two ways. And you can look at it that maybe these two um, massive hulls, not, you know, hulls as in MISC, inter, you know, MISC, uh, was it MISC interplanetary? You know, not holes in like hole C, hole D, hole E, but holes as in, you know, massive capital ships. Um, you can either look at it that they're, you know, essentially like the Kraken. And, you know, they made the exterior and everything um, for Squadron 42 and it's not functional and the ships aren't done. You know, um, you know, but they have, you know, gotten the ball rolling essentially. But they, you know, did it for this part of Squadron 42 and... You know, you don't otherwise don't see the ships. You know, maybe it's maybe it's like that. We don't know because we only saw a short section. Um, or, and this is you know, and that's the the realist in me is that you know it could very well be like that. Um, but the optimist in me wants to think that because of what we're going to be reading uh, for the lore, 
for these two ships and the manufacturer that they come from, that the ships could be well into development, if not done, and have, you know, it been done behind the scenes. Um, whereas the Bengal is announced, the Idris is announced, the Javelin is announced, um, you know, and so their their work, you know, the, the to polish them and get them ready for release in Squadron 42 and subsequently the PU, you know, that has been publicly available on the progress tracker um, and talked about in the monthly report. I think the work for these ships, because they are technically unannounced, um, large, you know, essentially unannounced, has been hidden behind a curtain um, and either in unannounced uh, parts of the progress tracker um, or within the uh, different deliverables that are, I think it's like Squadron 42 vehicle support, that sort of thing. So, last warning, if you don't want any spoilers whatsoever, um, you don't want to see anything from this leaked video, you know, um, come back in 50 minutes because I, I should be done by then and we'll be going through the latest comlink um, uh, 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 installment from uh, Far From Home with old Jigger. Um, but if you want to see just one image with no audio, no context, no other, you know, nothing else, you know, to me, it's not a spoiler because it's no different than showing us the Bengal, you know, the, especially the exterior of the Bengal or the Idris of the Javelin, um, then, uh, you've been warned. So let's go ahead and hopefully the, I've got it in studio mode. Let's, what is, why is it all jacked up? Uh, I hate it when it does this. Oh, wait, I know. Um, it's... Why does it look weird? Oh. And I just did this to make it all look correctly. Well, we'll transition and I'll just have to edit it on the fly. Thank you for being patient. Or patient. Huh. Okay, so I'm not losing my mind, but so I have OBS in studio mode, and for some reason things don't look right on studio mode, but they do look right um, in the scene. So. You can see here, we have a clip. I just took a screenshot of you know an image. This clip that shows this, it sort of pans from left to right around these ships, and so I clipped it right when it's sort of centered on them. But you can see here that we have two very large ships with very familiar profiles. Uh, here, let's go ahead and, oops, wrong one. So obviously, you can see that, especially on this side, this one over here, I, a lot of people that I talked to that saw it were like, oh, that's a Bengal. And I'm like, nah, that ain't a Bengal. It does look very similar. Um, it does look an awful lot like a Bengal, which makes a lot of sense because of the lore that we're going to be getting to here in a second. Oh, where's... There we go. Chat's back up. Okay, cool. Um, but you can see that the the lines and the curves are very similar to the Bengal. It is obviously the hull 
and the shape of it are very much um, influenced by the Bengal. You know, this is clearly a Robert Space Industries capital ship. But it looks like they have made a lot of modifications to the, the lines of the hull, the shape of the hull in different areas, and slapped some massive turrets on it. To me, it looks like these turrets are um, maybe, not, uh, maybe not the same size as the one on the Bengal, just because the length of the barrel and the size of the barrel. And they're very similar to the ones that are on the underside of the Bengal, but that is a quad, tur a quad turret with quad, I think it's 130 millimeter ship buster rail guns. To me, even with, you know, this one's kind of more confusing because I think they're shadows because of, you know, it's hard to tell because of the lighting. But I think this one and this one are obviously dual turrets. This one may be a quad, but I think it's more likely that these are just duals and that there's a shadow, you know, like the light source is coming from here. Because you can see the shadow like this, the shadow like that. I think those these are the shadows of those two barrels. Let's see, Shady Phase, first time. Thank you for joining me. Um, thank you for coming and hanging out live. But uh, yeah, the this is definitely not a Bengal. Um, and if you quickly watched the leak, you know you may have missed. They're like, oh yeah, that's definitely a Bengal. Because at first glance, I did the exact same thing. I was like, oh, that's a Bengal, totally a Bengal. And then, but I immediately zeroed in on this. I was like, that's very different. What is that? Well, you can see that there's these massive turrets right here that are clearly not there on the Bengal. And here we'll make this not full screen um, because we're going to go to the browser and go here and we'll look at uh, not this one this one so here's a, a good shot of the bengal here's another good shot of the bengal from on top and so you can see that you know this is actually right here um, this is sort of like a, a runway um, because there's a hangar back here below the bridge it's where the combat air patrol um, is stationed out of uh, 07, Brennan G, welcome back, brother, sister, elephant, whatever you identify as. Thank you for joining me again. But yeah, Shady Phase, um, if you didn't notice those turrets, it, you know, it, it, because it's such a short bit in the whole video, um, it's, you know, it's easy to miss, for sure. Um, especially because it's only 720p. Um, <laughs> Brennan G, it just got off work. Today I'm a toaster. <laughs> Yeah, you, I, I feel you. I feel you. We're, I was actually thinking about that when I was reading the uh, the comm link that we'll be doing in the next episode here in a little bit. But you can see, and I, I wish I could do a side by side, but these turrets and this one back here are clearly, I'm going to move this right there, not there. The other thing that's interesting is if we go, I think this one's a better angle. You can see that right here, this is basically flat. From where the hangar is right here all the way to the front to where it dips down to the, the front of the, the launch tube door. Um, whereas this one, it looks, you know, because of, you know, how turrets work on battleships, battle cruisers, you know, they can't, uh, the, this rear one looks like it's on an elevation relative to the front one, even though the bangle is flat right here. So that's another significant change to the hull that in order to keep uh, to get these two turrets on up front here uh, without this sticking way out in front and being awkward they raise the elevation of this one um, and you can see that right there let's go back so you can see that there's none of that elevation change that you see right here um, behind this turret where this one is risen has risen up uh, the other thing that's really interesting to me and it's a less noticeable. Uh, let's go to the one that's more the vertical one. There you go. So you can see back here. So this whole wide, thick boy part of the bangle, this is where the, the main hangar is. The, from about here forward is essentially launch tube. And then when you come back in, you come, you know, return via this hangar door and you pull in, you know, slow down. And then this is the main hangar. And there's actually giant lifts to the left and the right that will take ships um, up and down from, you know, from the sort of the, the ready hangar to the storage hangar. And there's a screenshot of that here farther along. But you can see how um, this comes back and it tapers in pretty quickly. 
and then it's more narrow through here. And then you have the big old arm that the dual, that the, the engines are, are mounted on. And it's not, uh, let's see if we can find a better image. You can see that there's this big main engine, you know, coming straight out like that. And then a much smaller one that's more vertical. If you remember, this is a shot from uh, uh, Invictus Launch Week. Um, this is uh, actually the UEES Barbary. But if you look at this one, it looks like it has that same straight out part, um, but there's doesn't it, there's nothing obstructing it to show that it would have that second engine up here. The other thing that's interesting is you can see how far forward and how far backward these main engines um, on the Bengal go, but they don't seem to come nearly as far forward or as far backward on this battle cruiser. So it looks like the um, the main engine nacelles, the main thruster nacelles are smaller um, and or oriented differently than the ones on the Bengal, and it's lacking the secondary ones. Uh, let's see, shady phase. It looks like the bridge was moved farther back too. Yeah, it looks like it's either farther back as well as potentially smaller. And the it looks like there's a, a thing sticking out here that is not on the Bengal. The other thing that was interesting is I can't see any lines back here to denote what would be the rear hangar door. And that makes me think that because you've got big old turret here, big old turret here, big old turret here, you may not even have a hangar or a dramatically smaller hangar um, because I think that this is the battle cruiser that has been, um, we haven't heard anything about since a, for a very, very long time. Um, and it would make sense that if you've got a giant gun here, a giant gun here, a giant gun here, you might not have a hangar underneath these. You might just have the magazine. And that space that would normally be for launch tube and hangar is used for storage of munitions, the, the automated loader systems. Think like the Perseus. Um, you, know, we, you can see that automated loader in the Perseus concept art. Think like that, but way bigger. Um, yeah, and so perspective may be tricking us into thinking this is as big as the Bengal, but it could be a smaller ship. That's a good point because I did consider that, um, and we'll get into that here in a second, because there are three stretch goals that we haven't heard anything about. Um, you have, uh, and I, I, I'm leaning more towards this is the, I think it's the $17 million stretch goal, which is a battle cruiser. I had the, the link up here in a second. Um, I think it's the battle cruiser just because you know, if they stuck to much the same hull design, similar but different of the Bengal, it would be really big. Um, and, it, you know, could be battle cruiser versus battleship, you know, maybe not as heavily armed or armored as a battleship. Or it could just be a shrunken down uh, hull similar to the design of the Bengal, but it could be the cruiser, which is also a stretch goal. Um, and I definitely think I'm with you, Shady Phase, that this one to the rear here is the updated design for the Pegasus. I think that um, in order to maintain the RSI design language that um, has developed in a, in a pretty short period um, following the fall of the Messers, and we're gonna get to that lore here, I think that the, the design language and the more uniformity between the Bengal, you know, the Battlecruiser and the Pegasus is much more fitting with the Pegasus looking like this than the original white box concept art that we saw many years ago. Um, but we're going to get more into that as well. Um, so that's my interpretations of this ship in the front, that it's most likely a battle cruiser with at least three. You know, there could be, uh, because we never got any undershot of this, there could be more turrets. I wouldn't be surprised if there was another, you know, because there's, if maybe these are 130, you know, maybe these are dual 130 millimeter ship buster rail guns. So between these three turrets, it would have six versus the Bengals four, um, which is pretty good for a battle cruiser. But if there's an additional, like maybe one down here, you know, you can't tell, um, and maybe another one down here, you know, on the belly, maybe, you know, that would give it ten of those, you know, uh, shipbuster railguns versus the the Bengals four, which would definitely make it a much more robust battle cruiser um, versus. Um, you know, if it was just this armament, uh, just the cruiser. And I think it would be 
a bit awkward to only have these main guns on the top and not on the bottom. You know, it leaves you with a giant blind spot if an enemy can get below you, because obviously this guy isn't going to rotate very quickly. But let's move on to this ship, and we'll talk about this one, and then we'll get into the lore um, that I think is very pertinent to why these are the way they are uh, and what they are likely to be. So this ship, um, you can see also, you know, just like, you know, with these lines, you know, from here coming along like this and coming up here, very similar, basically from here forward coming all the way up, just minus these sort of the almost hammerhead looking uh, nose, but the lines are very similar. It just looks like they removed the nose and or um, cut it off and shortened it and made it angular. But if you look right here, this is very much reminiscent of this guy right here. And we're going to click through these to find a better one because there is one. There's an old, uh, where is it? This one, this will do. Um, so this is the sort of runway for the combat air patrol. They've talked about this before and you can see the hangar door back here and there's actually a hangar back there for storage of fighters, you know, to basically rapidly launch um, and, and be the uh, sort of, you know, the, the escorts as the Bengal is flying around because you wouldn't have all of your fighters flying around. You just have, you know, your, your ready fighters, you know, the ones that would launch you know, on a moment's notice if there's a threat while you're mobilizing, you know, whatever else you need. But uh, obviously you can see that this and from the top down, very similar with even with the little arrows and everything is very similar to this. Although I think that this is smaller and potentially shorter because of how it got, you know, basically got cut off from here. So if you see where this is and where the, the sort of cap airway and you can see there would be like, it looks like it's probably a hangar door. You can see if that got stopped right there and cut it off it would be a much shorter ship because it's just this cut off just in front of it. So basically right here is where this, you know, that ship is cut off relative to the Bengal. Um, you know, so maybe this is about the a tenth, the length of the Bengal, uh, maybe a little bit more, maybe, you know, if the Bengal is nearly a kilometer long, maybe this is about a hundred and, you know, hundred plus meters long. Um, and so this ship loses you know a good a bit of length at least right there um, but then it's harder to see because this is in shadow um, but you can definitely see that this is much different and much shorter on the back end than the bengal it almost looks like it tapers off at this point right a little bit farther well you can actually compare it right here you can see that sort of that hump on the back end is different between these two ships. It's also different from the hump on the, let's get a better shot. It's also different than the hump on the Bengal. Um, subtly different, but different nonetheless. You can see that it comes back down here, has a little step down, and it's very, it's similar back here, but it looks like it's actually wider. But then there's almost like nothing back here, and you're like, where does it go? And I think this sticks out and probably just, you know, cuts off and comes straight down essentially um, about here and so you have a much shorter um, you know rear runway um, it, it towards the back for bringing in ships so you'd have a, a whoops wrong one you, you'd have a substantially shorter ship than the Bengal still a, a, a not un, insub, not unsubstantial hangar but a much shorter runway uh, or, or take a, a return area and so uh, maybe even, you know, it comes in here and you've got less room for moving ships that might even cut into the hangar space on if this is the Pegasus, um, which could help justify the, what they told us years ago about the, um, the amount of ships, you know, fighters and such that the Pegasus carries relative to the Bengal. Um, it, it would make sense that the hangar might be smaller, both interior, but also being cut off and shorter. The interesting thing, though, is if you do look at these engines, um, the engine nacelles, they are uh, they do they are dramatically different than these ones, and pretty substantially different than the ones in the Bengal. 
But if you remember what the Pegasus looks like, these sort of fin things at the back are reminiscent of the original Pegasus uh, concept art in White Box. Which Shady Phase, yeah, you're right. It is pretty obvious that this ship is substantially shorter than this ship. Um, and while this battle cruiser is probably very similar in length to um, the Bengal, if we're not, if scale is you know all things being equal, then that would probably make this ship a good 200, maybe 250, even you know, possibly even more meters shorter than the Bengal. It still is huge. We're still talking about seven to 800 meters long um, from tip to tip, but obviously substantially less displacement. Um, the other thing is, even though this is very grainy and, you know, because of the quality, um, it is, um, you know, you, you likely have a lot of the weapons emplacements that are on there, but n nothing is sticking out to me as far as large offensive weapon emplacements like these turrets, like, uh, let's go back. Just give me a good shot of the belly turret. That's the belly turret from the back end of the Bengal. Look how massive that thing is because it's that giant quad turret. Oh, here's that good shot of the internal hangar. So this is the internal hangar. From, uh, this is on the SC Tools wiki. Um, you can see this is the sort of launch bay going forward, how it's so much narrower through here and wider through here um, because of these giant lifts. And then it go, these lifts go up and down between the main storage hangar. We don't know how far this hangar runs front to rear we just know that it's wider at this portion you can see that these are ready fighters um, that are right here but can also be moved in order for other ships like a you know retaliators that are stored to be uh, repositioned but uh, there's obviously uh, let's get back to this one you know on this one you can see a lot of these smaller defensive weapon emplacements and i think that's what we would see on an escort carrier like this um, no big offensive weapons just a lot of defensive weapon emplacements uh, the other thing that this could potentially be um, and i kind of doubt it just because the lore leans more towards anvil being the ship that would produce this type of ship but it could also be um the uh my, my favorite ship, my dream ship, which would be a LHD equivalent. Um, LHD being landing helicopter dock, uh, the classification of ship that the U.S. Navy and many other navies use uh, basically as your helicopter carrier, but also carries landing craft and a ton of Marines. But the lore um, that we have from the Liberator comm link suggests that it's Anvil that makes this ship, and this is clearly RSI design language. Uh, but uh, let's go ahead and take a look at the lore for Robert Space Industries. Um, actually, before we do that, let's look at the comm links for the stretch goals um, so you can see what I'm talking about. So the $15 million stretch goal, and these stretch goals are from way back when, 2013. So this is these stretch goals come from um, the time post-Kickstarter uh, when... Um, there was a whole lot of, you know, hey, do you want to make this game bigger? You know, and we said yes. And they're like, okay, well, in order to make it bigger, we need more money. Here's the stretch goals. If we reach these stretch goals, we'll add these things into the game. Um, obviously, a whole lot of things that, uh, you know, planning wasn't uh, in, you know, still isn't. But planning wasn't something that CIG did really well. But the $15 million stretch goal, and this is when Star Citizen was meant to be a much smaller and more um, less grandiose game, um, you know, it, it, you know, no planetary landings, you know, all that sort of stuff. Same thing with squadron. Um, but the $15 million stretch goal, um, uh, unlocks, uh, uh, the $15 million unlock adds another flyable ship class, flyable, not purchasable, flyable to the game, the oft discussed escort carrier, which is what the class of ship that the Pegasus uh, was supposed to be or is supposed to be. We don't know what this is, what its name is, but it looks like it could very well be an escort carrier doing, be, uh, due to it being likely much shorter and less, uh, far, far, lo far less tonnage than the Bengal. Um, and then for the $17 million stretch goal, 
The $17 million mark unlocks a special ship upgrade for every pledger who has donated prior to this point. An engine modifier will be added to your account shortly, and in the near future, you should be able to see it in your hangar. You also unlocked an additional flyable ship class in the finished game, the Massive Battle Cruiser. And flyable is a very important distinction. Because these ships had never been purchasable, it stands to reason that uh, the flyable ships being the Battle Cruiser and... Um, let's see. Uh, I don't. I'm not going to search for it right now, just because it would be hard, you know, harder to find. There is another ship goal, uh, sh uh, stretch goal that had the cruiser as a flyable ship class. Um, and while they've never insinuated it directly, they have said that you know in the past that um, they want to make it so that way players could um, find. You know, could never purchase a Bengal, could never purchase anything larger than a Javelin. Um, but you could possibly find a derelict Bengal out in space and be able to refit it and get it back into, into service. And that's what many people, including myself, have speculated would be possible with these flyable ship classes. That, you know, maybe there would only be one or two Bengals ever to be able to be found out, you know, maybe in the, the Tiber system or Virgil, you know, uh, derelict from a battle decades ago. Um, but that there might be more, um, you know, relative to, to scale of, you know, the battle cruiser, the cruiser, the escort carrier that you and you org, you know, could find, you could sell that location back to the UEE, you know, for a ton of money. You know, oh, thank you for finding, you know, our lost ship. Um, or, you know, it would be a huge endeavor. You and your org um, could uh, refit it and get it back into service, you know, um, as, as best you can and try and fly it and keep it to yourself. Would, you know, because these things are supposed to be persistent assets. You can't destroy them. You can just disable them. Shady Phase, hoping the Anvil ship is an assault ship too. Something designed to carry multiple Valks. Shady Phase, did we just become best friends? I like you. I like you a lot. Welcome to the cult of the LHD. Um, I even have a little emoticon emoji that I made for um, my Twitch and in my Discord that uh, doesn't work just yet. Shady Phase, if you are not a member of my Discord, um, I would love if you would join us, my friend. Um, but yeah, I am... I am hopeful that the that an Anvil capital ship would be uh, an assault ship as well, you know, designed to carry multiple Valks, you know, and you know have a a cargo hold, lots of cargo and ground vehicles. Yes, Nikon, one of us, one of us. Um, and I'm at, you know what? While we're at it, let's talk about that lore too. Liberator. Uh, Tom Lake Star Citizen. Is it this one? Here we go. So, this is something that a lot of people overlook, um, and I did not because I latched onto it uh, like a, a, a dog to a bone. So, this is from the Anvil Liberator um, concept sale, and, and when I read this, I just about you know had a stroke. Or a seizure, or, or both. Uh, the uh, so uh, from the Navy's most ubiquitous fighters to massive warships and large-scale troop and vehicular transport, Anvil is synonymous with space combat and military operations, due in no small part to a laser focus on the mission at hand. Anvil continues its tradition of excellence with the Liberator, an open-air vehicle carrier that applies the tradition of long-range transport these guys, to a smaller scale. This is Anvil saying that the Liberator is meant to do the, you know, do this on a smaller scale. Um, designed with the same quantum drive and long distance capabilities of military spec carriers, military spec carriers, and pathfinders, but tailored to the civilian market, the Liberator puts your fleet on the front lines of any operation. So, this is saying under no uncertain terms that the um that anvil makes massive warships ooh heavy armor big guns i think we should i think the if anyone is going to be making the replacement for aegis having fallen out of favor for like the idris um and the javelin it would be anvil but i think that anvil because they make the valkyrie and the valkyrie is a dropship it's a landing craft 
um, Anvil would also make the large-scale troop and vehicular transport, which is just a fancy way of saying LHD. Um, in Shady Phase, you say LCAC. I think that the Liberator is the brainchild of somebody who saw the concept art for the light amphibious warship. Let's go ahead and pull that up real quick and you'll be like, oh my God, light amphibious warship. Do, do, do. Was it this article or... Which is the one that had the bingo? Tell me this does not look familiar. Let's see, they have a side profile shot. Eh? Eh? Yeah, vaguely resembles. Just a just a touch of a similarity there. And, but this is just a thing that the Marines want to build. That they've been trying to get Congress to fund. They're taking, you know, uh, proposals and stuff. You know, it's um, it's an interesting thing that I, I've been reading about because it's a a new concept as part of the changes going on in the U.S. Marine Corps in order to uh, be ready for a future fight in the um, in the Pacific, you know, against China. Um, yeah, uh, the. The only difference between the Liberator and the LCAC is the LCAC is launched from an LHD or an LPD, whereas the Liberator, you know, is wouldn't be launched from something. The Liberator functions much like the, the light amphibious warship does, um, in that it is more for, um, you know, taking smaller units and their vehicles from uh, in essentially island hopping campaigns, which is you know essentially what a Liberator would be able to do is allow you to you know hop from one planet to another. Um, Navy and Marines needs more money and newer ships to compete with China. Absolutely, Night Cub. You, you nailed it. But yeah, that, I think that somebody in CIG was just Googling stuff and, you know, concept artists and they're like, oh, we should make one of these. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that is, um, so we've got the letter, the stretch goals that sort of give us a hint of what these are very likely to be after looking at the shape language between them and the other RSI capital ship that we know of, you know, or, you know, a combat capital ship, the Bengal. Um, but we also have a good amount of lore for RSI as a manufacturer uh, that supports them being the ones to make these ships. Um, and, and we're going to take a look at that really quick. So the, this is the, this is jump point, uh, issue five, like from 2013, the very first, um, uh, I don't want to say season, but, um, you know, issue, you know, one zero five. So the first year of jump point issue five, and then, uh, they did the, um, the corporate profiles. They've done these a number of times in, in um, in jump point. And so this is the first one for Robert space industries. Uh, and if you are not a subscriber, um, to, um, for, for star citizen and you don't have ready access to the jump points, I am, if you are in my discord, I will happily share them with you. If you want to read them, um, you can also find them pretty easily online, but, um, uh, they're, they're pretty good reading there. You know, you can find a lot of really good lore there and a lot of interesting development stuff and as well as really cool pictures to look at. Um, I, I thoroughly enjoy them, but uh, we're not going to read through the whole article, but one thing that is really interesting from this initial, uh, they've done more than one um, company profile is the capital development team. So RSI development is divided into several major teams dispersed around the Seoul system because RSI is actually headquartered in Seoul. Uh, RSI is old money. They're old earth, um, but they are headquartered in Seoul, although they do have shipyards and you know, a, a substantial presence um, on MacArthur in the Killian system, which is the headquarters for the UEE Navy. So one of those teams is the capital development team. Um, larger spacecraft, including military contracts, 
RSI Capital Development Team output includes the mover transport. It also serves as prime contractor for the Bengal carriers. So essentially, RSI is the ones that build the hulls and a lot of aspects of the Bengal, um, but they don't build all of it. There's so many other components and parts of the ship, you know, weapons, everything that are built by other manufacturers. But RSI is the prime contractor. You know, they're the, the ones that own the shipyard and they build the hull and then they've taken other things made by other companies and put them in there. But um, the RSI capital development team output includes mover transport. It also serves as the prime contractor for the Bengal carriers, among other projects. Hmm, wonder what those could be. Maybe a paddle cruiser? Maybe an escort carrier? Especially considering the Pegasus was originally supposed to be made by uh, Robert Space Industries. Um, it would be hard to name a larger spacecraft in service today that does not use at least some RSI produced technology. Hard to name a larger spacecraft. These look pretty damn big to me. Uh, the capital development team is headquartered at L5, where larger spacecraft can be constructed in orbit. Now the question is, I'm assuming they mean L5 for Earth, um, but uh, that's a, a pretty interesting little tidbit uh, because we can, based off of where Earth is in you know on the star map um, in game, we can show you where L5 would be, uh, and it also um, helps to suggest okay uh, shipyards. Yeah, when, when CIG gets around to making massive shipyards that would make these sorts of ships in game, both uh, in the solar system, in the Killian system, and elsewhere, there are other, other mentions of large shipyards, they would be at the Lagrange points. They wouldn't be um, your low Earth orbit stations. That's what they call the ones that are um, in orbit above, you know, Hurston, Arcor. Those are low Earth orbit stations. Baijini Point, uh, Everest Harbor, um, Port Alisar. Those are low Earth orbit. They're not in. They're not in stable uh, Lagrange point orbits. So if you want to go see where these things are being made eventually, you know, in comparison to you know the smaller shipyards and docks that are on Oris, you know, on Orison or on Crusader in Orison, this is where they would be. Um, the other thing that's really interesting is let's see. So the other reason that it makes sense for RSI to be um, uh, the, the company that would make these capital ships is because Aegis um, had really close ties with the Mezers during the, the reign of the Mezers. Um, let's see, and it's right. So RSI, um, Let's just read through this. The Dark Age. For many, the ascension of Ivar Messer to Prime Citizen was a welcome change. At the time, the UPE had well-documented scenarios where endless bureaucratic debate completely stalled the government's ability to do anything, so cutting through the dialogue in a single direction wasn't seen as particularly ominous. Unfortunately, Ivar consolidated power over the years and subtly removed any checks. I'm sorry, this is from Jump Point 0509. So this was in... 2018 you can still see this is the older format before david ladyman left he's the original producer editor of jump point magazine so i think this was in 2018 is when this came out it was about that time you know 2017 2018 um unfortunately ivar consolidated his power over the years and subtly removed any checks that could challenge him making it difficult for most people of that time to realize exactly what was happening after his son took over the title of Imperator, the Second Devaran War provided a perfect opportunity to remind the public why they needed to uh, why they needed decisive leadership. And again, this is a RSI company profile article in Jump Point. Um, they just updated and added to it. So a lot of the same bits and pieces from this original one, way, way, way back when, with more um, more fleshed out lore. Um, as the Messers became more and more ensconced in their position, RSI lost their military contracts to Aegis Dynamics. Um, that's why we, you know, we, we know about the, the Perseus, because the Perseus is a legacy ship from before the time of the Messers. Um, they still, RSI maintained the contract um, with the UE Navy to produce the, the, the Perseus, but they likely made other ships prior to the time of the Messers that stopped being in production um, and 
you know, Aegis likely took over. So that's when we got the Idris, the Javelin, um, potentially other carriers. We know that there um, is a carrier that uh, predates the Bengal um, because it's what is crashed onto the planet of Ashana, um, yeah, Cult of the Perseus. We, in my Discord, we are the home of many cults, uh, but all the cults are friends. We're, we're, we're harmonious cults. Um, but uh, on the planet of Ashana in the Null system, there is a crashed carrier that f essentially forms the landing zone on that planet. It's the home of smugglers and slavers and all that. It's actually ran by a Tavaran warlord um, or, or, you know, a, a Tavaran criminal overlord. Um, but uh, there's also mention of battleships that are no longer in service. You know, those ships, the previous carrier, the no longer in service battleships were likely Aegis designs. You know, and the Idris and the Javelin are holdovers from that time just because, you know, it's taken time to build up the um, production capacity with other companies in order to build ships to replace those ones. And so we've got replacements from RSI in the form of the Bengal, whatever this battle cruiser is, whatever this likely escort carrier is, these are probably are you know, these are replacements from RSI to replace aging Aegis designs since Aegis has fallen out of favor. Oops, wrong way. Um, that wasn't to say that RSI was immune from the Mezzer's wrath. Oh, sorry. Several of RSI's divisions still work closely with the scientific bureaus and terraforming oversight committees, but as, but as a whole, the company converted into a primarily commercial and civilian corporation. This is actually why the Orion was built, um, you know, because they they had all these resources and they converted over into civilian operation, and so they made the Orion. It's also a good um, way for the lore to um, describe why. Oops, RSI is the company to make the large miner that we just voted on at CitizenCon. It makes sense. Even though I wanted Argo, a lot of people wanted Argo, it makes lore sense that a large miner would be made by RSI because that's what they've been doing for centuries is making large uh, commercial and civilian ships. Uh, let's see, Shady Phase. I like the lore of the Perseus. How RSI is bringing it back after the last one still in action took on and beat two Vandal cap ships and won impressing admiral bishop yeah it's a super cool story um especially because you know it, it happened really recently it isn't a oh they were in a skirmish you know two decades ago no th this ship was part of you know the uh, the the fight in the oberon system that not only bloodied the nose but literally spanked the vanduul um you know for the first time it is really cool really impressive that you know a ship that's been in constant production for as long as the Perseus has, is still out there and, and making a comeback. You know, even though it's an old design, you know, it, it still works. It still it still does the job. Um, but I think you know that that's why the design is so different because you know the Perseus is a legacy ship. It's an old design. It, you can see while there is still some um, bits of the RSI de design language in it, it varies substantially from these and. Uh, where did it go? The and the Bengal. This is a, a much more contemporary design. So if we come back to this, um, and, and this is just more talking about how um, you know even R you know RSI you know survived as a company, but they lost favor with the Mezers, you know, and the Mezers even forced their CEO to step down uh, because the CEO. Um, radically, you know, changed the company to make sure that they weren't doing the things that, you know, they weren't employing children after the Anthony Tanaka incident. Um, so after the fall, in the wake of the revolution that toppled the Mezers, the empire experienced a period of freefall. The newly installed Emperor Toy and the restored High Advocate and High Secretary were busy trying to ferret out the rotten elements of the government while the various planets seemed to turn on each other. For a while, accusations of having collaborated with the Mezers became the weapon of choice. Some of these charges were legitimate, but the unscrupulous used the accusations to escape debts or finally resolve feuds with their enemies. While Aegis Dynamics felt the brunt of the people's fury and were commonly cited as symbols of tyranny, that's why fewer, you know, they don't have um, the, the, the military contracts that they did, you know, they lost a lot. They weren't the only ones to suffer from these witch, hunt, these witch hunts. 
As a company, RSI hadn't exactly prospered under the Messrs. rule, but they had maintained their status as a prominent company, um, which is why they still had the, the massive shipyards and all the infrastructure in order to continue you know, to build big ships after Aegis you know, lost all their contracts. Big ships. In, in response to these, um, uh, several historians of the era asserted that while RSI didn't actively promote the Mezzer agenda, they consistently failed to use their considerable influence to decry it. In response to these allegations, RSI established the Future Foundation, a specific division of the company devoted to charitable donations and grants, and announced that for the first time since the founding of the company, they are going to add a new tenet to Chairman Robert's original list of corporate philosophies, stand for good. So um, this is basically, you know, the, the UEE has gotten rid of the measures and they're purging, you know, not like Warhammer 40K purge, you know, but, you know, basically ousting all the, the remnants of the, the measures and measure loyalists from the government um, and, you know, government contractors, which is why Aegis, you know, fell down so hard. Um, why we don't see, you know, new big military designs, but, you know, Aegis is trying to reimagine itself in the uh, civilian market. But, um, you know, the UEE and the UE Navy had to find somebody to make new ships, you know, make new designs, you know, because essentially um, design and advancement in the, the production of ships had you know, really ground to a halt with the, uh, the measures stymieing any, any production with all their corruption. And so the UE is like, okay, RSI is still here. You know, they've still got the production capacity, these big, big shipyards. They've got experience building big ships, you know, with the uh, Orion um, and whatever this large miner is going to be. You know, we need you guys with, you know, they still have their capital development team. We need your capital development team to help us revamp our fleet to take on the Vandal threat. Ta-da! You have these and you have the Bengal. So the Mezzers... Um, the uh, the Bengal was introduced in 2871, only 81 years ago from present times, and the measures. Let's see. The Mezer era um, ended about a century before that. It's, where's the, I had a timeline. Yeah, 2792, right? Yeah, 2792. So in 2792, the measures were, were deposed. And 80 years later, we have the Bengal. So it took 80 years for you know, the Bengal to go into production in order to, you know, it, it, you know, you've got the, the empires in free fall. They're struggling to, you know, to, to keep everything together and they need to revamp their fleet because nobody wants Aegis anymore. And so, you know, the RSI got a whole bunch of contracts. Well, it's going to take a while for them to design new ships, build new ships, go through all the production stuff. You know, um, Night Cobb is a, a Navy veteran and he can tell you, you know, how much work goes into, you know, the, the design of these ships, you know. Um, but it makes sense that it would take, you know, decades before a new carrier could be introduced to replace. And this is just when the first one was launched. You know, they're still in production. It's still considered a new hull. Yeah, Night Cobb says decades usually. You know, and so same thing, same rule applies here. It totally makes sense that, you know, uh, uh, while the UE is stymieing their free fall, you know, following the the uh, the revolution against the Mezers, it would take a while for them to recover and then start building something new. Yeah, I imagine the UE Navy suffered a lot during that time with having hard times getting parts, um, you know, putting new ships on the line, everything. Um, but if it took them 80 years to get the Bengal into service, at any, you know, it, the these ships could have influenced the Bengal. These ships could have been, you know, hey, we're going to replace our aging battlecruiser first. We need those on the line first. And they built this one. And maybe this one, they're like, oh, you know what? We can just turn this ship into a carrier, which makes sense because in human history, our, the, the first carriers that the, we 
we used, you know, the first uh, carriers that we developed, you know, uh, back in the you know early nineteen you know hundreds, nineteen twenties, thirties, forties, were ad- adaptations of cruiser and battle uh, cruiser and battle cruiser hulls. That's why the abbreviation for carrier is CV. It's uh, cruiser, you know, verta verta something verticali or whatever. It just basically means a cruiser with aircraft with vertical, you know, combat potential. Because they started off as cruiser class vessels, and only later did they become so much larger, you know, larger than cruisers and even battleships. Um, but it would make sense that, hey, RSI could build this ship, and then they could modify it, you know, uh, or you know, take a similar, you know, take the design uh, and redesign it in order to make the Bengal and make it more affordable, uh, put it into production sooner. The same thing could be said for this. We don't know which one came first. We just know that these are definitely RSI ships. They're definitely RSI ships made by, you know, made and designed by the capital development team because the capital development team and RSI survived the purge following the measures. Um, Let's see, the other thing, and this is the most recent um, update to the RSI company profile. Another really good image of the Bengal. Look at the size of that turret. Good God. And that's a, a four-barreled one. So way back in 2013, Jump Point, this one, first feature, uh, featured the first portfolios of Star Citizen's various ship companies. Pardon me. These introduced countless details to the game world, some of which went on to become major parts of the living universe, like the Hull series or the Starfire Gemini. We've updated the RSI po- portfolio today in honor of the launch of the Scorpius Fighter. So this is just a couple months ago. This updated version keeps the original story of RSI, what we just read in these two, and um, and then adds timeline order coverage of the over a dozen new designs and variants introduced in the time since we last examined the brand. So it's basically a long timeline, and they include a lot of the same stuff from the previous jump points, but they also go on, you know, lots of images of the uh, of the Perseus for you, Night Cop. And you can even see, I love this image, a Perseus escorting a Bengal. How cool is that? Uh, let's see. The Here we go. This is the one we're looking for. And let's zoom in on this part over here. Because this is the, the important part where they're talking about the Bengal. So, um, like I just said, there they have the timeline for... Um, all the ships and all the ships in the profile. Um, the interesting part is in this one, in this company profile, they don't mention the Pegasus. And a lot of us thought, ooh, did the Pegasus get canned? You know, is another company going to make the, um, the, the Pegasus, you know, make the escort carrier? But then when they updated the Galactopedia like a month after this, they did show that the RSI still makes the Pegasus. But this paragraph is really interesting. With the fall of the Mezzers, RSI leadership began making a tentative outreach towards the military to offer increased support. Hey, you guys are getting rid of Aegis. Uh, you, you need some help? Um, military planners, meanwhile, were interested in additional ways to avoid continued reliance on Aegis dynamics for new spacecraft designs owing to its association with the Mezzer era military. In the end, the military was grateful for the support of the large space yards RSI had to develop to produce the Orion and other large ships, the capital development team. Other large ships. Totally makes sense that they're going to make the large miner. Ultimately choosing the new company, or choosing the company as the prime contractor for the new Bengal class fleet carriers. Uh, the project would heavily involve RSI with the military for the first time in centuries and would leave, would leave a distinct RSI brand on the modern Navy. So this actually suggests that these two ships came after the Bengal, but that these, whoops, sorry, these two ships, along with the Bengal and maybe something else, are huge parts of the modern Navy, replacing Aegis. Uh, The project would heavily involve RSI with the military for the first time in centuries and would leave a distinct RSI brand on the modern Navy, which is built around Bengal battle groups. RSI continues to revise and produce Bengals today alongside support for additional military carrier platforms. Additional military carrier platforms. 
like this guy not so subtle yeah um but yeah they, that's that is the the lore and the development uh pipeline behind these two leaked ships now none of this is confirmed obviously cig you know didn't even want this stuff you know with these coming out they didn't leak this you know or you know unless you believe in conspiracy theories maybe you do maybe you don't i don't think that they leaked this on purpose but um i, I do think that this particular image out of the whole video leak um it is really interesting because of how closely it is associated with the lore that we just read about in these three jump points, as well as it follows right in line with these two stretch goals. It's too much convenience for me to ignore. Too much coincidence, sorry, for me to ignore. And that's why I'm super excited about these, about these ships. And again, uh, like I said at the beginning um, of this episode, uh, I think that there these two ships could go either way. I think that they are, you know, already done, and because they built the Bengal, they are able to use so much of what they did from the Bengal in order to make these ships in game, just like how the lore suggests that they, you know, did, you know, in the verse, or uh, and that these are actually real and that maybe we will see more of them in the follow-on episodes of squadron 42 um or that because they are you know only going to be sort of in the background of squadron 42 episode one maybe they are like the kraken from the commercial for the kraken in that we have a exterior that's pretty to look at but it isn't functional in game and that they're largely hollow or you know work in progress um i'm gonna be optimistic but we don't know but either way, I hope you have enjoyed uh, going over these ship holes with me and taking a look at this image. Um, I hope no one thinks that it's spoiler. I don't think it is. I think it's just a, you know, hey, look at these cool ships. We have already seen the Bengal and the Idris and the, the Javelin. I think it's perfectly fine for these to be out there in the world as well. Um, but I also found that after, you know, because I had already read these jump points and read these lore bits. And as soon as I saw these images the wheels, you know, the, the hamster wheel in my brain started to turn. I was like, oh, it makes so much sense now. That's so cool. It totally fits. Um, and it fits perfectly. But yeah, that's all I have for this episode of Lore Equals Gameplay. We're going to transition back to the regular chatting screen here in a second in order to start off the second episode where I'm going to be doing a read-through of the latest uh, com link uh, along with uh, talking about how the, the lore from that com link um, is related to gameplay being developed for Star Citizen, uh, along with a little bit of a guided tour um, related to that com link via the Arc Star map. So stay tuned. We'll be right back. And we're still live, guys, so you can still talk. I'm just going to edit that out before I upload this next episode. Um, or before I start this next episode, because I'll be uploading both to YouTube in the coming days. Um, I'm going to go ahead and drop a link in chat for my Discord. If you are watching and joining me for the first time, again, I just want to say thank you. Um, and uh, before we start this next episode, I'm going to remind everybody who's still here live with me, if this is your first time, this is a charity this is a charity channel. This, this, con everything I do on Twitch and on YouTube, all the content is for charity. That's why there's that charity thing in the chat for stackup.org. So, um, let's see. There we go. There's the link to my Discord. Um, so you can, you know, stackup.org is a uh, nonprofit organization that help con helps connect veterans and um, active duty military with video games and video game communities. Um, to help them cope with long deployments as well as PTSD from their service. Um, I, I have, I, I've benefited greatly from video games and video game communities as well because I am a, you know, I'm a, if you, if you don't know, I'm a former infantry Marine, multiple combat deployments to Iraq, and I'm also a current uh, active duty or current Army National Guard flight paramedic uh, with the deployment to Afghanistan. So I've, I've had my own trials and tribulations. It's why I believe in stackup.org. And uh, so anything that you donate, 
you know, uh, via the, the charity drive goes directly to stackup.org. And as well, any because I made affiliate on um, on Twitch, and I'm hoping to uh, uh, start uh, getting my, my YouTube up and going as well. Um, oh, here, let's transition back. I, uh, any, mo- any monetization that I get from Twitch, from YouTube, from my content, from my streams, from things like this, I will also donate to stackup.org. It's probably not going to be much because I'm, I'm small time. I'm small potatoes right now, but every little bit ha- uh, helps. And as I, you know, the as the community, my little community that I'm building grows, as my content grows, hopefully more and more money will come in and I can donate more and more to stack up. Um, but once you know it starts rolling in, I plan at the end of you know each month to basically, you know, put a you know image out on tw- on Twitter saying, "Here's how much I received. Here's my donation receipt to StackUp.org." So if you feel so inclined, um, please donate. Uh, if you aren't able to donate, I'm just glad that you are here. If you can give me a follow, um, you know, on, on Twitch. It helps the channel to grow, and I'm also going to put in a link to my YouTube here in just a second. And so if you can uh, like and subscribe on YouTube, um, it also helps that to grow, so that way I can start um, getting monetization that way, because all of that will go to uh, stack up as well. So let's see. Um, I also want to grow my YouTube because I'm at like 30, 30 subs right now, 30 or 30 some odd subs right now. If I get to 100, I can get the custom YouTube channel URL, and that way it'll say Trio 311 instead of a bunch of letters and numbers. But uh, Lore Equals Gameplay will gets uploaded to my YouTube along with the Pathfinders podcast, which I host most Mondays on here with Nazareth. And then starting Friday, we have a new podcast that... Um, I am going to be producing and hosting here on my channel with Night Cobb, who is here with us today and hanging out in chat um, as my one of my co-hosts, along with Atira Kell. Um, if you watch um, the Astro Pub uh, Captain's Table, you may have seen the episodes with Atira Kell and Night Cobb. Um, I was on the one with Atira Kell, um, but they are both uh, active duty military personnel, and they'll be joining me and we'll be doing a live podcast that will get posted to YouTube later uh, where we're talking about various uh, aspects of Star Citizen from our more military perspective. Um, and we're doing this, you know, I, I asked them to do this with me uh, because I, you know, again, it's for charity. And I, I, I knew that those two guys would be all about helping other veterans just like them, other military members just like them. Um, and we've been having a lot of fun getting ready to get this started. Um, but that'll be this Friday on Twitch at twenty uh, at nine PM Eastern, um, and the event is also in my Discord. Um, so if you you want to, you know, catch that, uh, like, subscribe, follow, all that sort of stuff. Um, but let's get go ahead and get started with the next installment of Lore Equals Gameplay. And give me one second, and here we...